Hi, everyone. We'd just like to welcome you to the Securing Liberty Public Forum Round Robin. Um, we'd really like to thank our host, Stuyvesant, for having us here today and all the teams that came from across the country to be here. Um, we're really happy you guys came, and I've definitely seen a lot of great debates. Um, the judges for the final round will be David Remnick, editor of The New Yorker magazine, Clyde Haberman, The New York Times NYC columnist, and Irene Chang Sumino, former general counsel and secretary for the Lower Manhattan Development Council and current general counsel of CEDCO. Um, so in the final, we're going to be debating the resolution, Ethnic Profiling is a Just Means of Combating Terrorism. Regis will be speaking first on the pro, and then Montville will be speaking second on the con. Um, once again, thank you for being here, and we hope you enjoy the final. Is everybody ready? And can everybody hear me? Or let me know. Sorry. Can everybody uh, hear me? Thank you. All right. We support the resolution, ethnic profiling is a just means of combating terrorism. Ethnic profiling is defined, according to the Open Society Institute, as the use of generalizations grounded in ethnicity, race, national origin, or religion, as the basis for making law enforcement and or investigative decisions about who has been or may be involved with cr in criminal activity. Ethnicity or nationality need not form, we observe, a litmus test for threats, merely one factor in evaluating them. It is very important to remember that we are discussing ethnic profiling as a response to terrorism, not in dealing with something like common crime. Terrorism is real, and the consequences of our failure in combating it, of letting even one terrorist plot slip through the slats of our already fragile fences, are measured in innocent lives and maybe thousands. Now, that does not excuse, excuse, of course, every action taken, no holds barred. But it does, though, call for attention to any implement that may ameliorate the threat, if never efface it. Ethnic profiling is such an implement. Our first argument is that consideration of race does not constitute unfair discrimination when grounded in rationality and not bias. We have a cultural tendency to, to treat all distinctions based on race as taboo. That often involves a healthy, uh, improves healthy and keeps race or nationality from blurring our discourse, but that tendency does not invalidate race as a practical consideration. In fact, we often use it. Uh, if, ro if a robbery is witnessed and the thief is a white man with black hair driving a black sedan, police will stop, will, will stop as many black sedans as possible, but in the inevitable triage, they will naturally scrutinize cars driven by black-haired Caucasians somewhat more. That is not racist or discriminatory. It is rational. And that is the vital and operative distinction here. Similarly, in targeting an Italian mob ring, police naturally look for Italian suspects. In neither of these cases are rights violated. No right not to be inspected closely. Of course, the example of terrorism does seem to be, to be playing with statistics a little more and does seem a little less specific. But the robber and mobsters involve statistical questions, too. The robber may have disguised himself. The mobster might be the godfather's Tom Hagen, a German-Irish mobster working with the Italian uh, mafia. And once we've agreed, then, that race or nationality or religion, which were to all, all those were to, that we're talking about here, can be considered based on statistical likelihood, to paraphrase George Bernard Shaw, now we're just haggling over the price. Our second argument, then, is that the price on the other side of the equation, the consequences of not profiling, helps us justify the practice, even if ethnic, pro ethnic profiling were unfairly discriminatory. In any war, including our war on terror, we accept certain tragic costs. We know with certainty that dropping bombs will involve the killing and maiming of innocent civilians, which we try to avoid, but we do know with actuarial certainty will happen. But if we are prepared to accept those costs, if we are prepared to accept indeed any costs of war, especially a war on terror, then surely we are prepared to accept ethnic profiling's ostensible unpleasantries. But is race a line in this country or in any country that we cannot cross? In fact, we have already established race considerations in the face of compelling need. In affirmative action, schools engage in the court-sanctioned use of race as a factor. The compelling interest there is diversity in education, not innocent lives as with terrorism. When it comes to ethnic profiling, we have used far less to justify far more. Our third and final contention is that ethnic profiling is effective. First, terrorists do fit a general profile. According to the investigative project on terrorism, more than 80% of all convictions tied to international terrorist groups and homegrown terrorism since 9-11 involved defendants driven by a radical Islamist agenda. In the September 11th attacks, for instance, 15 of 16 hijackers were from the Arabian Peninsula. And next, as mentioned earlier, we are not advocating ethnic profiling in isolation. We need to profile behavior, too. But the reality of our resources limits us, and ethnicity and nation of origin and religion should aid our triage. 
In reality, it does make some sense, to, of course, to dampen ethnic profiling, not to use it all out, so to speak. Mathematically, the square root tends to be the key. If a group is nine times more likely to be a terrorist than the population, it is proven effective to investigate them only three times as often. According to a study from William Press from the University of Texas at Austin, square root sampling will let us identify our terrorists with the maximum efficiency possible given the resources we have. It results in the terrorists being more likely to be caught at an earlier checkpoint than by any other method. And thus the science backs up our intuition. We do not accept ethnic profiling lightly or exuberantly, but we feel that we must accept it nonetheless. Thank you. Sorry. Um, are the judges ready? Are our opponents ready? All right. 1800s. All blacks are inferior to whites. 1940s. All Japanese are spies. 2000s. All Muslims are terrorists. Because categorical discrimination, like the historical examples just mentioned, is unjustified under any circumstance, my partner and I negate resolved. Ethnic profiling is a just means of combating terrorism. The word just is defined by the by Merriam-Webster dictionary as acting or being in conformity with what is morally upright or good. And the word means is defined by Merriam-Webster dictionary as something useful or helpful to a desired end. An observation that we would like to make is that even if a means achieves a good purpose, it doesn't mean that the means is just. However, if an action does not promote the desired end, in this case combating terrorism, it cannot be a just means. Thus, our thesis is that ethnic profiling is not a just means of combating terrorism because first, it is ineffective, and second, it is unethical. Contention 1. Ethnic profiling simply does not work. A quick look at population demographics shows that ethnic profiling is statistically doomed to fail. Mike German in a Cato Institute study indicates if that if profiling was targeted at Arab Americans to identify Muslims, only one in four would turn out to be Muslim. The vast majority, 63%, are actually Christian. The Muslim population in America is composed of various backgrounds and cultures. Asians, African Americans, and Arabs make up nearly 30% each of the total Muslim population. Thus, if we wanted to thwart terrorism, we would end up profiling a superfluous number of people, rendering the action ineffective. Furthermore, terrorists don't fit a single profile. Many terrorists come from Europe or from the United States. For example, Umar, the famous underwear bomber, was Nigerian, and Colleen LaRose, Jihad Jane, was a radicalized, blue-eyed, blonde American. Richard Reed, the shoe bomber who pled guilty to eight counts of terrorism, was white and Jamaican, and Tim McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber, was white as well. If ethnic profiling is used, terrorist organizations are likely to try to recruit people from outside the Middle East and Southeast Asia. This analysis holds true empirically. In a study with the University of Texas, William Press concluded that profiling based on race was no more effective at finding terrorists than random screening. Thus, ethnic profiling in terms of religion and race is impossible to use consistent, to consistently combat terrorism. If it were widely implemented, terrorists would simply recruit people who would not fit the type being profiled. Contention 2. Ethnic profiling is unjust because it is unethical. First, ethnic profiling is in direct violation with the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which guarantees equality for all citizens. At the point where ethnic profiling, by definition, is an unequal approach, it targets select citizens of a certain religion or race and therefore is unlawful. Second, ethnic profiling creates backlash against the entire Arab Muslim community. In his book, Islam and Muslims in the Post-9-11 America, Abdul Ghalizi explains, Arabs and Muslims' constitutional rights to free exercise of religion and assembly, due process and security from re unreasonable searches and seizures have been violated. The erosion of civil rights came in the form of various programs and legislations, such as the USA Patriot Act, which effectively nullifies Amendments 4, 5, 6, and 8 directly, and indirectly Amendments 1 and 9. The follow impacted the daily lives of Muslims at school, in the workplace, in general, in general public encounters, and mistreatment at the hands of federal officials. Many Muslim homes and businesses were raided while profiling-based interrogations and searches became a norm. In that book, Galizi stated that Muslim communities in California were troubled that each of the FBI's 56 regional field offices were based in Muslim communities to investigate terrorism. Thus, Muslims are unjustly targeted as a result of ethnic profiling, which impacts the rest of their lives. Even if ethnic profiling is targeted to be used only against those who pose a serious threat, this is not the perception amongst American citizens. The perception ethnic profiling creates is that a certain race or religion is dangerous, rationalizing and normalizing racism. Because of this perception, Muslims are unfairly discriminated against in the workforce and have their rights substantially reduced. Thus, because it is not a means at all to combating terrorism since, it's a, uh, since it is unlikely to succeed and it is unethical and immoral, ethnic profiling can never be justified. Therefore, we urge a con ballot.
Everyone ready? Okay. All right, so in terms of your second contention about how it's not just, um, and you mentioned that we have to look for equality for all in general, right? Yeah. All right, so would, can we then take race into a factor in, face, in the face of any compelling interest? Can you explain? For, for instance, affirmative action, is it just to take race into, into context, as, as the Supreme Court has upheld itself? I mean, obviously that's not the topic we're discussing, but it's I not. would say that, like, sure, under that situation, um, affirmative action is not justified. Okay, so you, you would advocate that race can't be used at all as a compelling factor. How about in going after an Italian uh, mafia ring? I'd say that shouldn't be done either. But the thing is, so you're, going to, we, be public, you're okay. going to be publicly declaring this sort of policy, right? Like, the police don't go out there and tell, like, they don't advertise, like, look, we're looking for all Italians. What if they do that, like... I mean, I think the Italian mob ring will probably realize that, that they're looking for Italians, right? The Italian mob ring would, but it's not like the police yeah. go out there and announce to the rest of the public that that's what they're doing. Okay, okay. But, but that's addressing the question of backlash or whatever. But So you're saying it would be unjust, just for simple moral treatment of treating people equally, to target Italians specifically in that situation? I'd say we should be treating them equally. Okay, so we should not specifically look for Italians and bringing down an Italian mob ring. That shouldn't be, like, what the declared policy is. So sh should it be our policy, though, officially or unofficially? I don't know. That's not what we're debating. Is there anything inherently immoral about considering Italians in that specific case? I mean, like, if you're going under my framework, then yes, what I've been telling you, like, consistently is that, like, we shouldn't be doing that. So, so, it, so I just want to line this out. It would be immoral, then, to look specifically for Italians sure. and trying to bring down an Italian mob ring. Okay, thank you. Would you like to ask a question? All right, sure. So... Let's say we have two different methods of achieving an end goal. Both are equally effective at achieving that end goal, mm -hmm. but one has certain harms attached to it. Which would win in this round? Oh, well, we're going to contend that affirmative. That, that right, I know, but like, let's just set that up right now. Like, if we prove the same benefits, oh, who wins? If you prove it's if I prove that you have additional harms attached onto it. If you prove the, that it's immoral, then yeah, then you would win. If you win both of your arguments, then... And just a question yeah, about, sure. like, a study you, spent, uh, you mentioned. Sure. William Press's study? Uh, is that yeah, that's from yep. the University of Texas. Yeah, University of Texas at Austin, absolutely. All right. Um, just when you talk about, though, and, you, and you, you give a quote here, what he's doing in that specific case is comparing the effects of strong discrimination. That is, if someone's nine times more likely to be a terrorist, or, or a, gr a group is, then we investigate them nine times as much. But when he looks at actually square root sampling, where if they're nine times like, likely to be a terrorist, you look at them only three times as much, still more than the population, but dampened and lesser, he finds that actually has a positive effect more than any other their possible means. Right, but then doesn't he go out and say that, like, his statement is that racial profiling in general is equally effective as no, random searches, right? No, he says strong racial profiling versus random searches equal, yes. But in terms of using a limited form of racial profiling and, and effective targeted means, he said is more successful than any other means possible. I mean, we, we, can, we can provide the quote on that. All right. Um, I'm going to have to ask a question then about, about your point about how it's statistically doomed to fail because there are so many different groups and they're so diffuse, right? Right. Like, you mentioned the okay, example absolutely. of how, like, the so, Muslim group or the extreme okay, Islamist sure, sure, group sure, is supposed sure. to be that. But okay. we tell you that, like, yeah. racially, we have, they are yeah. very diverse. In, in terms of the, in the European Union, currently, the majority of terrorists convicted are from Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. Would it be valid, then, for the European Union to specifically target those groups? Um, my argument here is that if you go out and target those groups, like, what we say is that the terrorists still have another way around that, which is that... That's, a, target that's a separate argument, yes. But in terms of it's so diffuse, then, it's, it, in certain situations, then it's not diffuse, Right. I'd still say that they shouldn't be, like, are obviously I'm going to say that they're not going to be, they shouldn't be, like, doing that sort of profiling, right? No, it, w it wouldn't be effective, even, even with a specific majority there. I'd say that we have alternatives. Okay, well, that's, that's we'll a different argument, but I think we're yeah. out of time. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry to do this again, but can everyone hear me? Okay. 
Okay, we'll start at the top of my opponent's case. Their first con contention, excuse me, their first observation has to, be, has to be both morally justified and effective. Now, we can agree on the effectiveness point, but we have to see is when we look to our first contention about the morality of the practices we take in the fight in the war on terror, we have to, we have to understand that certain things we do, maybe we may not dis we may not enjoy doing it. We certainly may be something we prefer not to do in the case, I'd say, of terrorism in, ad in addition of ethnic profiling, but it doesn't mean it isn't just. We look to the fact that when we willingly go to war, we do it reluctantly. We don't want to kill civilians, but we go to war and we take acts that with an actuarial Excuse me. With certainty, will kill civilians. We do not mean to do it, but we still accept that these consequences justify the means we seek in seeking peace and saving lives. The same thing can be said about about ethnic profiling. Insofar as we are understanding that there is some harm, but we need to see balance it in the terms of the lives saved. So on to my opponent's contentions. They talk about how it is ineffective, and they talk about how you essentially can't divide the Muslim community into any particular profile. However, as my partner noted in the first crossfire, we looked at the fact that most of most people come from North Africa when it comes into the European Union when it comes to terror crime. So already you've got three countries that you could scrutinize when you're dealing with safe flights into the into the European Union as a way of preventing terror. So already you see a profile emerging. Also they talk about the Nigerian the Nigerian terrorists within the United States, the shoe bomber. However, they were all tied by one thing, as most terrors, terrorist acts of terrorism are. All are tied to 80% by to radical Islam. So already, as we noted in the definitions of our case, religion is also a means by which you you um, you profile. What we see is that you have an effective means of tying all these people to a specific profile. So essentially, at that point, we're showing you, as my opponents are claiming, you can't statistically find that these people belong to the groups, but we see they actually do belong to the groups, and at that point, you can effectively screen for them. To take a hypothetical example, we see, suppose a plane was going to jail. AFK with 10 Scandinavians and 10 Saudi Arabians with a one-way ticket. I think some of us would be particularly worried despite the fact that they may not want to come back. So at that point, you see that, good, we're making inferences on specific things. We're not trying to dehumanize them. We're not trying to harm them and, dehum and reduce their value. But we have to admit that they fit a specific profile that those groups of people are more likely to attack them. And therefore, in, a limited, in, in the society we live in with limited resources, I don't think the budget's going to get any bigger as far as our deficit is concerned. We have to see that we need to most effectively employ our, employ our resources, and we do that by effectively by using ethnic profiling as a way of assigning it to the most likely cases. Now on my opponent's second contention about how it is unethical. Now my, my, it came out especially in the crossfire that my opponents take a very strict idea of racial equality and that is admirable in so many ways. But we have to see that many of the things that we consider in modern society that we would agree to aren't actually held within their philosophy. We see affirmative action within the universities. We see the fact that you can't go after those of Italian descent if you're going after the Italian mob or the, the Casa Nostra because that would be discriminatory in some way. These are the kind of things that we've consistently done for years on end and we still see it going on today. We have Whitey Bolger and the Irish mob in Boston. Uh, it, would it be unfair to go after those of that, of that descent in that area? It doesn't make any sense. So essentially what my opponents are asking you to do is to, for the abstract idea of racial equality that even we as a liberal tolerant nation do not share, look at the Supreme Court, we still see that they're essentially asking you to sacrifice many lives, both in terms of crime, but in what we're debating as well, terrorism, to, the, to this abstract idea that very few people share at all. So at that point we can see is we may have different ideas about morality, but we see it, it's not entirely inconsistent to say that, look, Ultimately, we have to choose based on racial profiling. We do not want to. We do not want to discriminate in this manner, but we do not want to have terrorism infecting our lands either. We want to save lives as much as possible. We look at affirmative action where the justification for discriminating on the basis of race was for diversity within our school system. But look, what is the justification for discrimination in the, case of the, in the case of this debate? It is for saving lives, which I think is a far more compelling justification. Now, I would also like to further point something out on the idea of Muslim backlash. Ultimately, what we see is we have to... We have to admit that, yes, you can alienate people by engaging in this action, but we have to see is there is a calming method precisely because you, as a population, you can understand, yes, you fit a specific profile and it is shown to work. When you start stopping terror attacks, that is exactly the kind of support that you engender for a policy. So when such a policy does show the effects it has that we've demonstrated in our case, that you reduce the amount of terrorist attacks hitting the United States and it would save lives, that backlash will certainly go down. Thank you. Are the judges ready? Opponents ready? Uh, we'll start at the top of the pro case. 
So on their first contention, they say it's not unfair if it is rational. However, what is going to be deciding this debate is that if ethnic profiling is just or not, is if it's moral or not. Just because it's rational doesn't necessarily mean it's just. We have to look at the end outcomes, the results of ethnic profiling, and only then can we determine if it's just or not. And when looking at the end effects and the alternatives of to ethnic profiling, you're clearly going to see that ethnic profiling is unjust. So they give the uh, they give the analogy of the Italian mob rings, but sure, Italian mob rings are only made up of Italians, but not all mob rings are made up of only Italians. Likewise, terrorist groups, not all terrorist groups, are composed of that one specific uh, radical sect of Islam. They stated that there is that radical sect of Islam, but that means you have to go after all Islam to find that radical sect, and we showed you how Islam is diversified, so that's clearly impossible. But even if you don't, there have been attacks uh, uh, of terrorism that were committed by non-Muslims. We cited four examples in our case that were non of that um, that radical Islam uh, that radical Islamic sect that uh, that were of some of them were of Anglo Christian sects. So that 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 just proves to you how the acts of terrorism aren't committed by one group. So if you do ethnic profiling, it's clearly doomed to fail. And they acknowledge that only 80% in their case, 80% are from this sect. So if you do ethnic profiling, terrorists will logically recruit out of the 20% that is not profiled. At that point, ethnic profiling won't work. So they said it's uh, based on statistics. Um, uh, they, they base this idea on statistics, however, uh, and then it's not, it's not racist because it's rational. However, it's deliberately racist because ethnic profiling makes generalizations about entire communities. In criminal cases, the Supreme Court has condemned ethnic profiling against African Americans for a long time because of its unjustness. If ethnic profiling were used again in a way, there would be uproar because of this, quote, Islamophobia against uh, the Islams. There would be a perception created that this radical sect of Islam is bad and dangerous, and then there would be, like we said in our case, backlash against that community, like in our FBI example, the Muslim population is outraged that the FBI offices are located in their in their communities to, to find terrorism. But then going on, they say the there's an established race and that distinguishes that, that there's an established race that commits terrorism and that's distinguished. But however, there have been acts of terrorism committed by other races and who's to say terrorists can't just recruit out of those races. Then on their contention three, they say that it's effective because everyone fits a profile, but you can uh, cross apply our examples, our four examples which showed you that they did not fit the, fit the profile. However, the, uh, there's a study. There's. Um a study done by Commissioner of U.S. Customs Service Raymond Kelly that states, quote, there is a difference between ethnic profiling and behavior profiling. Behavior profiling has a high efficiency rate. Quote, in 1999, when the Customs Service abandoned a profile based on ethnicity and instead, fo instead focused on uh, behavior, its productivity in, uh, efficiency soared. The number of searches declined while the percentage of terrorists actually apprehended increased. So this shows you that if you use behavior profiling in conjunction with ethnic profiling, it's less effective than using using behavioral profiling alone. So that means ethnic profiling is detrimental and can clearly be abandoned because behavioral profiling is more effective. That's logical because it's clear, it's, it's better, uh, it'll lead to a terrorist more effectively if, if you uh, examine their acts, if they're acting nervous or not, if where they're going, the, um, the, whether they're wearing baggy clothes or not, that's a more effective uh, means of determining who's a terrorist rather than the color of their skin. But rather then you go to the square roots argument. The University of Texas professor, the press, determined that the if you use ethnic profiling and if you use random screening, the percentage of terrorists actually caught will be the exactly the same. That study we cited in our case. Ethnic profiling is the exact equivalent of random screening in and actually apprehending terrorists. So at that point, ethnic profiling only leads to backlash and racism sentiment towards the Muslim community. For these reasons, ethnic profiling is unjust because it's deliberately racist and has no unique net benefits. Thus, we urge a con ballot. Okay. Everybody ready? Yes. You say Al-Qaeda is going to recruit from other non-radicals. Not Al-Qaeda, but just terrorist groups in general. Would you agree that most terrorist groups tend to be radical precisely because they're willing to, act, to get you, perform acts of violence on Do civilians? Do you mean that specific sect of radical Islam? I'd say as a whole, when 80% of terrorist attacks are committed by those affiliated with radical right. Islam, yes. That's, that's exactly what I refer to. That means there's 20% not committed by that sect. And, and if there's ethnic profiling against that 80% sect, that 80% will just recruit out of the 20% that's ethnic not profi being profiled. If you mean that those who are religiously extreme are going to recruit right. from those who are not religiously extreme? Right. How's that going to work? What do you mean, how's that going to work? It's happened in the I mean, past. I, we can't have imagine, I can't imagine how a secular, secular American is going to 
respond to an not a secular American, but say we have an ethnic profile that's based on the one we've used Arab Muslim going to, to one destination radical Islam but there, I've shown you that there have been attacks on the U.S. committed by, say, Anglo Christians. Suppose those, those terrorist groups will just now, recruit more people who are not profiled like Anglo suppose Christians. Suppose there were 99. Percent, suppose 99 percent of all terrorists were New Zealanders, and one percent were, say, from France. Would that mean that ultimately? That's you can't, a, would now, my question is: Would you not ethnically profile them because one percent of them are French? That's a great hypothetical example, but the real example is eighty percent to twenty percent. Please answer, my, hypo- answer my hypothetical example. If would you not profile if ninety-nine percent of them fit it? I would say the ninety-nine percent would just recruit out of that one percent. If but, the, no, no, but uh, would I'm, you? Right. But would you not profile? That's not answering the question. I would say it's impossible to profile because of the resources. Now, I'd like to but ask... No, no, that's, I'd that's, like that's, to, but suppose you had the resources. I want to get this hypothetical. Then here. if we had the resources, it would be ideal. I would not use ethnic profiling at all because behavioral okay. profiling is uh, better. Question? So I have a question for you. On your, um, on your, based on, you said that uh, it's not racist, it's not unfair if it's rational, right? How does rationality justify... Um, if I make a claim that the vast majority of drug crimes are committed by those who are minorities, am I being racist? No. And if I act upon that, am I racist? Not necessarily. So how is it racist when you ethnically profile by saying that a vast majority of people fit this specific characteristic and we act not act on that? It depends how you act on that. In this case, you're drawing a distinction. Like your square roots argument, I pointed From out. From the very you, study you the, cite, your, mind you. Yes, your square roots argument. Sure, it might be effective in pointing out terrorists, but it creates a distinction. We're so saying would, so this terrorist group is fair. nine times likely to strike us. That so creates an anti-group so, sent, so, uh, racism in our country. I, I, are you suggesting that we have an anti-Al-Qaeda sentiment because we say they're likely to attack us? No, I said if we go out and we say this group right here is nine times more likely to commit a terrorist attack, that means the American public will fuel hatred towards that group. And that's I'd unjustly Ameri- going I'd to say, hurt all members say, of the group, even yes, if they're not terrorists. I say radical Islam is very likely to attack the United States. But, but, you, me, but I'm excuse saying me, you but shouldn't excuse marginalize me, excuse all excuse radical me, Islam. Excuse me, but I say the American people have a lot more reason to hate them than just because the government said so. Look at, twin, look at the very... Okay, but the, if the government says so, it's going to be fueling that mindset. Look at the very reason we're at this location. It's precisely because there are massive amounts of hysteria. Is everybody uh, ready? Thank you. All right, so addressing the main arguments here, one, the idea of morality, and then I'm going to go into things being effective and the more practical considerations. So first, the idea of morality, as came out in just the last crossfire, when my opponent was asked, is it immoral to make a basic rational rational judgment based on a percentage, he said no, and to act on it, he also said no. And that's the essential point we're saying here. It's not racist to act on these things. It's simply dealing with the correlations that do exist and acting upon them in order to save the most lives possible. Um, That's the same reason we have affirmative action. That's the same reason we target Italian mobsters when dealing with an Italian mob ring, even though all the might not be Italian. We recognize the reality, the the statistical realities and the benefits that we can have from them. We recognize that we're not being racist or unfairly discriminatory. We're simply responding to the percentages that do exist. Um, So so then it comes to the, uh, in order to justify the consequences of not doing so, which tend to be very, very great. And in the case of terrorism, we're talking about lives here. Then the second point here about it being uh, effective. First, there is a terrorist profile. In the European Union, for instance, the majority of them come from three countries. Currently, we're talking about 80% of of, of terrorists being radicalized Muslims. And and then so our opponents have several things here. First of all, they say we we should go by behavior. First of all, it's not mutually exclusive. And often a very effective means of uh, allocating behavior, the limited resources we have for that, is to use ethnic profiling. Uh, and, and, and second of all, they, they cite this uh, reform by, by the uh, customs. But actually, as Malcolm Gladwell points out in The New Yorker, that very reform that happened in 99 by our current police commissioner, actually there have been a list of 43 sp- 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 suspicious traits Sorry, that were, that were uh, taken into account and was replaced with a list of six broad criteria. One of those 43 was race, but there's no way to say that eliminating race was the one that did it and not the other 30-something that were also eliminated. It's really not a study that with a controlled scientific variable that we can draw anything from. At the end of the day, we need to do behavioral profiling, but also ethnic profiling. Then the other consideration they bring up about how they're just going to dodge it. First of all, that proves that you know, they're going to go recruit, uh, recruit outside. First, that proves that it actually works, that they are, have to go by some other means. And second of all, the idea that, uh, that uh, Zawari is going to... Um, is going to recruit t- to someone, someone like Timothy McVeigh really is, isn't likely. We're talking about very ideological differences here. And the bottom line, if we're reducing the operational capacity of the main core of, of terror, 80% being, being Islamic terrorists, if we can reduce that and they have to go outside that, then I would say that that is a victory in the war on terror. Thank you.
we're going to be starting on the pro case. Is everyone ready? Phone is ready. He keeps bringing up this argument about how, in reality, it's okay for us to make these sort of like moral violations. But our argument here is that if we have an alternative that does not involve these sort of moral violations, right? Like we bring up the behavioral profiling example. If we have those sort of alternatives that exist, then you're obviously always going to prefer those to the examples that they are providing. All they get up here and say is that racial profiling works. However, this is always going to be inferior to our argument, which is ex which is especially comparative, where we specifically tell you that first of all, random screening is basically the same thing as racial profiling. The two work equally the same, but then we have the second comparative argument that tells you when there was a removal of racial profiling and there was this implementation of simply using behavioral profiling, what that does is that it increases like, the, the efficacy of such profiling, which means that you're always going to prefer that because, one, it does the overall job, which they state at the top, the overall job we want to achieve is to stop terrorism in general. It does that better, but then second of all, it avoids all the harms that we continually bring up in our case, especially those of racism. But then... You can also extend the, continue to extend the argument that um, if, we, if we implement these sorts of racial profiles, then all terrorist organizations are going to do is look to other, other races. There have been examples of instances where people from our country went over to the Islamic countries, became those sort of radicalized people, and then did those terroristic, ter terroristic activities for the terrorists themselves. It has happened in the past, and it is a potential. These terrorists would be willing to obviously go out and try that, and they would be successful in doing so, and that would simply mitigate the effects of racial profiling. But then... The, another reason why you're always going to be vo voting con on this is simply the fact that it's unethical. Whether or not they continue to bring up these other examples where we do have racial profiling in our society, for example, with the Italian mafia or with um, affirmative action, we, so we can just get up here and simply say, just because it currently exists doesn't mean it's what ought to be. It doesn't mean that it, was, it is what is justified. So what we are saying here is that we should, under, like, if you look to our second contention, under all these different documents that exist in the United States, all the different ideals and values that we hold to be so important in our country, if these are violating those, then essentially use racial profiling is unjust, and for those reasons, we urge a con ballot. Do you have the full University of Texas at Austin study available to you? Yes, we do. Okay, so you could, could, you, could you provide it to us? Sure. Could you, or could you, could you, could you read us the portion that says they're equivalent? It's on my laptop. Uh, we'll yeah, if, if it's going to be in a timely manner, but we don't want to bog you down. I mean, what we're basically saying after, here is... After sure, would sure. You, would sure. you agree? I mean, that's, that's, not, okay, okay, that's not the crux of our argument there, uh, too. Uh, yeah, okay, it seems but, to be. But it seems to be that I mean, it's just that, that we have comparative thing. studies where, like, right. one guy co comes we'll up here and tells you... No, because what we're contending here is that, to make it very clear, is that the study compares strong ethnic profiling and randomized, and randomized, and randomized profiling and, right, and, and says that those are equivalent. Even, but even if you're but not when you find a middle ground, it's effective. Even if you use that racial profiling, if you look past that, you haven't rebutted yet the study that stated that if you use behavior profiling and ethnic profiling, take out the ethnic profiling. Right. Yeah. You, 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 you got up here and you said that there were different factors involved. Yes, exactly. Our argument is that our, 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 our argument is that because that exists and it's shown that that is a better alternative, then that is what you're always going to prefer to use. Right? Okay. I'll allow, so, allow us to explain it. Yeah. You, well, you, you, okay. If race is one of 43 things that you're using in determining the, the weather... It, it, it was. Are you citing Malcolm Gladwell in, 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 in your, New York? In your study, well, he's not citing them. Malcolm Gladwell is citing the same case of the 1999, 1999 borders reforms. Customs? B no. Borders reforms are the custom, or customs reforms, sorry. Okay. You referred to that. Okay. And in those reforms, very specifically, there were 43 factors they were using initially. Then they reduced it to six. The way it works in normal science, if you had seven factors and removed one of them, right. and there was a change, you could attribute it to that factor, that our, one variable. Our, our, but when there's 43 variables, it's impossible to attribute it to the removal of race as the actual factor and not the simplification of dealing with the, dealing with the actual people, which was most likely right, fine. the we, actual we, source. All right, let's move on. Okay. Well, and all, all, uh, additionally, then, is behavioral profiling mutually exclusive with uh, no. ethnic profiling? No. No. Thank not you. Mutually thank you. Thank but you. We say okay, no. all right. uh, thank moving you. on. Right. You, 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 you had a question then? All right. Yeah. So then, okay. What, like, okay, so even if we're still, like, why just, just because we do something now, like, why is because something is what is the current situation, why is that what is a justified situation? Well, you've offered us a general moral dictum that we treat everyone equally, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, we've applied this to mobsters. Do you right. think we should not go after Italians? 
I'd say that no, that should not be like that's a not sort of declared policy. We're right? saying right it now, should not be the government's like obviously the fact that objective to go after obviously the fact that exists doesn't qualify to normative questions. I just I just have one I just have one question. Should it be the government's should it be the government's undeclared policy? I mean, no, I don't know. I can't make no under you, you keep saying so. Is affirmative if, action just? If, if, okay, if mobs I'd were say only that no. comprised of okay. Italians, it would be just to go after only Italians. But if, since all mobs are not comprised of only you, Italians, it's unjust to go okay. after only Okay, so I, how about back to our example? If, if there were 99% of terrorists coming from one but country. That's not that's the case. Not, all right, but, but, 80, we're, but we're, we're examining the extents of our moral principles here. Okay, statistics, we give you what. Let's just calm down. What we're trying to do is offer a hypothetical to examine the logic underpinning our morals. Even so, if you so, give that argument, we give you the way that terrorists would deal with but, that situation. No, no, no. The but way that they but sh- you're, you're not answering the moral argument, though, then. Would you profile if 99% came from a certain In that case, no, because they have an alternative to get around yes, that sort of Because it wouldn't be effective, profile. but you don't have moral, con- moral qualms about it, though. Right. We'd use behavioral profile. Okay, everyone ready? There are two main points this round. First, the effectiveness of the, of the practice, and second, the morality of the practice. On the issue of effectiveness, my opponents have been giving a study consistently saying that strong ethnic profiling is, less effe- is just as effective as randomized profiling. We agree. We have the exact same study. However, what they fail to note is that light profiling, we don't have to profile to an extreme, is actually more effective and increases the chance of actually apprehending terrorists. So specifically what we're saying is that the very study they cite and that we cite shows you are more effective when you ethnically profile in a light manner before you start behaviorally profiling. It is a matter of allocating resources. We can have have a behavioral profile on everybody who passes through the airport, so we devote these precious resources to those who are most likely to require them, that is, who are most likely to commit an act against the United States or any other country. So at that point, we see the effectiveness is moving up. Now, the only other study they brought up is the fact that when U.S. customs changed, they suddenly removed race and there was a large decrease. Now, we looked to, we quoted the New Yorker where we, noted, where we noted that 37 of these other things were removed. So you can't attribute it to race. It's just as much 37 other factors. We don't know. So at that point, we looked to the logic. If you had a plane hitting towards the United States, 10 of them Scandinavian, 10 of them Saudi Arabian with one-way tickets, would we treat them the same? Because ultimately what we're arguing is that certain elements of data, the fact that they're tied to radical Islam, the fact that they're coming from a specific country where there's a history of terrorists attacking the United States, show that you should devote those resources, the behavioral profiles that are limited to those areas. Now, this comes to the issue of morality. What we see is that my opponents have offered a moral dictum that you should never treat people differently based off their race. And they are very consistent with this, that affirmative action is wrong. They should not go after Italian mobsters in La Casa Nostra. In Boston, you shouldn't go after Irish mobsters despite the fact that the Irish mob is strong. Well, we wouldn't share this dictum. I don't think anyone in this room would share this dictum as well. Ultimately, what we see is that we do treat people differently based on race when there are consistent goals that we need to reach. In affirmative action, we do it based on diversity in schools and ultimately a more diverse society as a whole, which we value. But I'd say perhaps a stronger and more necessary one is the saving of lives in the affirmation of the very values we suppose. So if we're going to accept these kind of dictums that we would agree with and broader society does, we have to see that ethnic profiling is not only a moral thing to do, but is required essentially to balance out and save the lives of people. Terrorists may adapt, but ultimately we prevent more lives by dealing with them most effectively and with the most rational means. Thank you.
I'll just be summarizing the key issues of this debate. Judges ready? Opponents ready. We have established both sides that the affirmative must prove the efficacy and the morality of this issue in order to win this debate. So if we disprove either of those, you're going to be negating as part of the frameworks of both sides. So first, on the efficacy. For, are, you can accept our argument that terrorists are comprised of different groups. The Muslim population is comprised of 30% African American, Arabs, and Asians each. So if you're going after the Islamic sect, it's very improbable that you're actually going to get the terrorists. And they cited in their case that 80% of, of the terrorists are from this Islamic sect. That's that still leaves 20%, which is a pretty strong number, pretty strong number that are not from this specific sect. So that who's to say they are not rebutting this argument at all? Who's to say those terrorists won't recruit out of that 20%? So if all else fails, you're negating because the terrorists can still get around ethnic profiling by uh, recruiting the people who aren't being profiled. They would recruit people like Umar, or like the uh, Colleen LaRose Jihad Jane, like Richard Reed, and like Tim- Timothy McVeigh, for examples of people not fit this ethnic profiled sect that are that have committed acts of terrorism against the United States. So at that point, ethnic profiling is doomed to fail. But second, we have proved that random screening is just as effective as ethnic profiling. We handed them the study in in uh, their prep time, which showed you that random profiling is the exact same as ethnic profiling. So at that point, you avoid all the negative effects of, of ethnic profiling by just using random profiling. But furthermore, we gave them another study that said if you use behavioral profiling and ethnic profiling, Profiling, take away the ethnic profiling, take away all race issues, and only use behavioral profiling, behavioral profiling is more effective. And again, you avoid all the immorality of it. But now that's the efficacy. If you look past the efficacy, it's immoral. Again, they have to prove immorality. It's immoral because you're drawing a negative distinction towards a group. In our study, we, in our FBI case, we cited that there is negative perceptions going towards Muslims because they are perceived as terrorists. They are uh, marginalized and ostracized. They lose out on jobs. That's immoral because they are a specific group that's ostracized. Thus, you're going to be negating on efficacy and morality. So I'd like to thank both teams for what was a wonderful debate. We're going to give the judges 10 minutes to deliberate, and we're going to begin the award ceremony in five minutes. Then judges will disclose their comments at the end of awards and also announce the winner. Thank you. just like to start by calling all teams that participated in the tournament to the stage to give them awards. Um, there was a selective application process to even be here today, and we'd like to honor them. So if you were in the tournament, please come up to the stage to receive your awards. First, we have the team from Hunter. Benjamin Cardoza. We have our 
Well, it's a very difficult decision, but to start, I just wanted to say that it's extremely moving to hear a rational debate on one of the most urgent issues of our time when it comes to the war on terror. The, to hear, and to hear such a debate just blocks away from ground zero 10 years after 9-11. Um, these debaters were uh, debating something that is debated in the press, uh, good and bad, and for, for positive and for ill, and that is the tension between security and civil liberties. Security and civil liberties, it's, it's something that we discuss all the time. It's behind uh, debates on torture. It's behind debates on profiling as well. And what was encouraging about the debate was the rationality and the calm and the marshalling of evidence. And it was an extremely close debate, and uh, I'm proud to say that to, to participate in some, something like this, and I'm sure that uh, some years from now we'll see you not only in, in college, but after that in the halls of Congress, and it can't be too soon. Um, I thought that the, um, the guys from Regis started off extremely well, especially in the, in the crossfire. But all sides had good prepared statements and de debate, but the crossfire, I thought that, um, that Regis in the early going dominated. Uh, they were ahead of the game. But I thought that in the end, the con side that Monfield caught up rather smartly uh, and I was also concerned that Regis uh, marshaled a, a Malcolm Gladwell article as if it were on their side when, in fact, Malcolm Gladwell was arguing against racial profiling. I can tell you from experience that's the case. And there were some moments that, of, of stray moments of would you not go after the Italians and um, that, that I thought that the other side weakened a bit, uh, although both sides were extremely strong. So in the end, I thought that the, the con side, the Montville side uh, argument about efficacy and about morality, even though their presentation might not always have been as strong as the Regis side, uh, they took the day for me. But it was extremely close, and I'm extremely proud of both. So thank you. Uh, I agree that uh, was really a very uh, uh, excellent debate, and having not really been much involved in debate, I was very impressed by uh, the manner in which each of the speakers uh, proceeded through very, I think, treacherous territory on either side. And um, I, I think for myself, as uh, formerly and for many years with the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, not being able to speak on some of these issues, I obviously have many views about terrorism, the effect and the impact on our community down here, as well as the larger um, you know, uh, issues facing uh, the, us as Americans. Um, it, it seemed to me as well that there were moments where I vacillated between the strengths and the weaknesses of each side's arguments, but I, uh, I, I believe that Montville uh, and I selected them as the winning uh, team because I think it's a very interesting thing that in debate perhaps the, the standard by which the argument is to be judged is in some ways defined by the debaters as to the proposition at hand, what are the key elements that must be discussed. And so I, I think in an overarching sense, I believe that Montville carried the day in helping to persuade me what is the standard by which this proposition needs to be judged. Um, to that end, I think there were many issues that I think weren't addressed, and obviously you had limited time, but um, I mentioned some of these just to highlight the challenges of what we may not have heard, which was the rest of their thinking, and if they had longer, uh, what they might have discussed, because I think the issues relate to race versus ethnicity, and that we as Americans can't say that we have one ethnicity, and whether this is a valuable consideration in this debate. Um, internationally, that may change as well from country to country, from decade to decade, terrorists have different faces. And depending on where you are, the terrorists look different. Um, to that end, I was fascinated by Regis and their self-defining of the, the 
ethnic profiling. So I, I commend you for defining it that way so that we might be swayed to your, to your side. And so from time to time I was. So I, I commend you all. I thought you did a wonderful job. I am very happy to be here and uh, hope uh, I can be involved in the future. Well, in a way, I probably should have gone second in the tradition of a boxing ring because it would have left a split decision um, to be decided by the third uh, referee. Um, in the end, um, I felt that the pro side articulated by the Regis uh, team was more effective in presenting its case. Um, David Remnick quite correctly um, frames, as does the very uh, topic title, uh, one of the key elements of our uh, world today of uh, security versus civil liberties. We've been debating it intensely in this country, obviously, since roughly 846 in the morning of September 11, 2001. Uh, it's not likely to change. Um, I felt that the uh, pro team didn't argue that ethnic profiling is desirable or that it's the only criterion, simply one, although an important element in a grand bag of, a grab bag of important elements that are indispensable. Um, I thought that the, uh, the very able uh, team from Montville, and I, I have to interrupt for a second to... Um, repeat what's been said, and, and I don't, none of us mean it, I'm sure, in a pro forma way. It is really overwhelming to see how articulate and how prepared and how thoughtful uh, these young people are. It's uh, extremely encouraging. I only hope that they uh, aim higher than Congress, uh, dude. Um, but that's for later in life. I, the Montville team was um, excellent in presenting the um, – the arguments, but I, I think they they lost me a little bit on the that twenty percent argument of that Islamic terrorists who use the dominant force. The eighty percent could always recruit out of the twenty percent. Uh, it doesn't strike me as indeed terribly likely that a Zarari is going to go uh, for a McVeigh. Um, it's a close call, indeed, as my uh, colleague said. But I thought Regis um, came out somewhat on top, but. As I said, I wish I'd gone second on this one to leave a little bit element of suspense to this. So um, uh, I do commend everybody here and thank the folks who invited me to be part of this. It's a great experience. Thank you. Second place team, Regis. And then from Montville, we have our finalists, and we have two Securing Liberty Flame trophies for them. Yeah. <laughs>